Queensland was a violent place 30 million years ago. Significant volcanism was something that this part of Australia hasn't witnessed in close to 200 million years, with the last real wave occurring in the Permian to Triassic period, with some instances of explosive volcanism also occurring in the Cretaceous. But yeah, it's been a while, and all that would change in the Oligocene, as this part of Australia became dominated once more by volcanism. The reason? Well, we were slowly drifting north over a magmatic plume, known as the Cosgrove Hotspot. And as a result of this, basaltic magma began to rise en masse, penetrating into the crust and erupting forth onto the surface. As Australia's tectonic plate moved north at a rate of 7 centimetres per year, this magmatic hotspot would slowly drift south and 7 million years ago it would finally pass through into Victoria, transforming it into the third largest volcanic field in the world. But this video isn't about Victoria, probably to the relief of many of you. This is about the incredible story of the geological formation of the Glasshouse Mountains in Queensland. ...are remarkable for the singular form of their elevation, which very much resembles a glass house. And for this reason, I called them glass houses. This is a quote by Captain James Cook, dated to the 17th of May, 1770. And you can see why he said this. These volcanic structures are quite remarkable to gaze upon. They are, however, not ancient eroded down volcanoes. They are, instead, magma that never got a chance to erupt, and it cooled and solidified within the Earth. But the volcanism that Queensland would experience began at Cape Hillsborough. An explosive volcano would erupt, and would announce its presence with a bang, literally. From here, basaltic eruptions occurred, and in other places, this basalt would melt much of the ancient volcanic rocks that existed in the crust, which were deposited here 200 million years ago during Queensland's most extreme period of volcanism. Because of this, the chemistry of the basalt would change as it rose up through the crust. It would melt these rocks and become enriched with silica, and the temperature of the basaltic magma itself would drop dramatically. As a result of this, it would become very viscous. Basaltic magma isn't really viscous at all, it's able to flow quite readily. But magma from the real explosive volcanoes are known as falsic at their highest end. And this magma does have a very hard time flowing. It's just so thick and viscous that it barely moves. And it's able to trap volatile gases and build up extreme amounts of pressure as a result of this. Which is why high silica magma is more associated with explosive eruptions than low silica magma. But the point I'm trying to make is, when Queensland drifted over this hot spot, the basalt and trachyte that began to pour into the crust would either remain relatively the same as basalt and trachyte, or if it was ascending along a fault line that had a high percentage of the ancient rocks that were either erupted or deposited here in the form of intrusives during the Permian and Triassic, then these falsic rocks would melt when the basalt made contact with it. And as a result, the magma would slowly change from the low silica, mafic kind that we see in basalt to high silica, falsic magma such as rhyolite. This falsic magma will continue to ascend, but at a much slower rate. And this slower movement speed means this magma will steadily drop temperature as it ascends. And when it reaches a magma chamber, if it isn't being fueled continually by fresh pulses of magma, eventually this magma will cool, and thus it dies out, so to speak, with it solidifying within the earth. Because of the high level of silica, this rock will naturally be more erosion resistant than the surrounding sedimentary rocks, which in this case was sandstone. And thus, over millions of years, the surrounding sedimentary material would continue to be whittled down and moved downstream to be carried away to creeks, then rivers, then out to the ocean. Whilst the more erosion resistant magmatic rocks, i.e. those that comprise the Glasshouse Mountains, remain. It's estimated that a few hundred metres worth of material existed here when this magma penetrated into the cracks and weaknesses within the crust, where it would then pull, accumulate 
and never develop enough pressure to erupt onto the surface. And as a result of this, the temperature of the magma would slowly drop to the point that it would crystallize and solidify beneath the Earth. Keep in mind, the only way that an explosive volcano can erupt in the first place is if the pressure within the magma chamber exceeds the pressure being exerted on it to contain it in the first place. I theorise that because this hotspot was forever moving south as Australia drifted north over it, it's possible that the continual movement of it is what led to these formations solidifying and never erupting, as a result of it not being fueled by enough melt to keep it in a magmatic state. Or perhaps this is just the way it was meant to be. This very same hotspot is what would lead to the creation of the massive Tweed volcano in New South Wales. And then, in Victoria, it creates some truly remarkable basaltic volcanoes, especially in the Ballarat Creswick area. So this is the story of the picturesque and truly remarkable Glasshouse Mountains, a relatively new geological feature added to Queensland by a hotspot that would go on to eventually create the world's longest continental volcanic track, which traces a line down Australia's eastern states, with its last eruption occurring only a few thousand years ago at Mount Gambier in South Australia. So who knows what else the Cosgrove hotspot has in store for us, but one thing is certain, it probably isn't good. Thanks for watching.